Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Katherine Seltner in our Washington, D.C. studio. Here's what to expect in this show. Planned Parenthood tries to profit off of Christmas. We speak out against their fundraising initiative. Hear an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with the new chair of the U.S. Bishops Pro-Life Committee. And this. We are here to ask everybody to please support the Conscience Protection Act. We introduce you to a group of pro-life nurses forced to participate in abortions or lose their jobs. They're now speaking up for conscience rights. But first, our top story, as Congress works to pass massive tax reform, one congressman is working to stop tax giveaways to Planned Parenthood. Under a loophole in the current law, cities, counties, and states can issue federally tax-free bonds to finance construction of abortion clinics. Representative Robert Pittenger of North Carolina has introduced the No Abortion Bonds Act. This bill would remove the tax-exempt status of any bond that flows to an abortion provider or abortion clinic. Joining us now from Capitol Hill is Representative Robert Pittenger of North Carolina, the sponsor of the No Abortion Bonds Act. Congressman, thank you for your time. Certainly good to be with you. You say American taxpayers have unknowingly been providing tax breaks to lower the costs of building abortion clinics. How can this be? Well, there's been a loophole uh, in the code that allowed for uh, these abortion, for these bonds to be sold for abortion clinics. Uh, these are tax-free bonds that uh, are usually used in municipal cases to build bridges or uh, infrastructure or schools. But uh, through this loophole, Planned Parenthood, for example, uh, was able to build and renovate a building in New York City, which became their headquarters, and uh, they had a $15 million tax-free bond to do it, and it was guaranteed by the taxpayer. Many Americans, if not most, are pro-life, but not every American is. Is that still reason enough to stop this tax loophole that you mentioned? Well, two-thirds of the American people really believe that uh, taxpayer funds should not be used for abortion. And so this is consistent with the beliefs of the American people. Congressman, tell us your strategy for this bill. Are you hopeful Republican leaders will incorporate your proposal into the massive tax code overhaul? And how much support, specifically bipartisan support, does your bill have? We have bipartisan support. We have Democrat uh, a couple of Democrat members, most are Republican. Uh, we have 87 co-sponsors at this point. Uh, Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, uh, Congressman Chris Smith, uh, Congresswoman Diane Black, uh, Congressman uh, Trent Franks, among others, are co-sponsors of this bill. So we have strong uh, leadership in our uh, House of Representatives right now supporting this. Speaking of pro-life legislation, there is a big push to include the Conscience Protection Act and the upcoming appropriations bill. Why is it so critical to advance conscience rights for pro-life individuals and healthcare workers? Absolutely. Uh, no one should be coerced or forced into doing something that's against their conscience, against their principles. Uh, we saw this with uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor. Uh, and we need to make sure that people's rights are protected, that someone should not uh, be in a position where they're forced, for example, to help perform an abortion. Finally, Congressman, why are you pro-life and why are you sponsoring the No Abortion Bonds Act? Well, as a Christian, I believe that life begins in the womb. Uh, you know, we've seen that even in sonograms today. Uh, I was many years ago in London and watched a little movie and it talked about the baby. The baby's one week old, the baby's two weeks old, the baby's three weeks old. And what was happening in that baby's life and the development of that baby. So this is a baby a life that cannot speak for itself. And so as a believer in Jesus Christ, I believe that I have a responsibility to speak for that baby. Representative Robert Pittenger of North Carolina, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. For reaction and continued analysis, we turn to a trusted pro-life expert. Marilyn Musgrave is a former U.S. representative for the state of Colorado and the vice president of government affairs for the Susan B. Anthony List. It's good to have you back. Thank you. It's good to be here. Congresswoman, I want to get your reaction to what Representative Pittenger told us about the Conscience Protection Act. How much of a priority, in your opinion, is this bill? 
Well, he said it very well. Uh, no one in the United States, uh, a medical provider, should be forced to participate in an abortion. And you know, the press conference where Kathy DiCarlo, a nurse from New York, spoke about her experience being forced to do that. After an abortion, she was forced to come up with the parts of the baby, and she wept as she said it. Mm. And uh, it's heartbreaking to think that people would be forced to do these kinds of things, violating their conscience in order to keep their job. So I would think even pro-choice people would understand uh, that people should not have their conscience violated in order to keep their job. You mentioned Kathy DiCarlo. We have a story on her and two other nurses who say they've been either forced to violate their conscience or lose their job. This isn't even about abortion, is it? This is about being able to follow your beliefs in the workplace. Absolutely, and you know, we have a shortage of medical providers. Mm. So the last thing we need to do is to demand that they violate their conscience in order to keep their job. So conscience protection is very important. The Speaker of the mm -hmm. House has said it's one of his highest priorities. And right now, conscience protection is included in the appropriations bill that has gone to the Senate. Can you break down the strategy for the Conscience Protection Act a little bit more? I know there is that upcoming deadline on the appropriations bill. Yes. Well, many times there will be a bill in, con uh, in Congress where there's not a standalone bill mm. that's going through. But when you have a piece of must-pass legislation, appropriation mm. bills that fund the government, those kinds of bills are attached. And because the House is pro-life, we have a pro-life majority there, mm -hmm. pro-life speaker. This has been attached to an appropriations bill, and so something has to be done to keep the government going. So it's a wise strategy, so it's been handed over to the United States Senate now. Finally, Congress is focused on massive tax reform right now. What kind of pro-life opportunities do we have there? Well, we have some very, uh, what I would call, unique opportunities in getting the definition of the unborn child into the tax code. And the House, uh, Speaker Ryan again, pro-life Speaker Ryan, and, and our allies in the House of Representatives have gotten that language into Section 529, which is educational savings account. Hmm. So when a couple finds out they're pregnant, they can already start saving uh, for the baby's college education. The important thing is that we get the definition of the unborn child throughout the code so that people know that this little individual is already a member of the human race. A lot of pro-life opportunities we have to be watching out for. Congresswoman Marilyn Musgrave, thanks for being here. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Being pro-life and having pro-life beliefs means nothing if we cannot exercise those beliefs. Current U.S. federal law does not sufficiently protect the conscience rights of healthcare professionals and others. There have been instances where health professionals against their religious beliefs were forced to participate in abortions. That is why the Conscience Protection Act is the top pro-life priority for the U.S. bishops and the focus for pro-life leaders. But this bill faces a looming deadline of December 8th. We need to take action now more than ever for this bill. It is urgent you help to get the Conscience Protection Act passed through Congress and signed into law. Here is how you can do that. Go to your smartphone or computer right now. Type in this website, ProLifeWeekly.com. That is ProLifeWeekly.com. It's on the screen right now. At this website, you will see three boxes. One, to type in your first name. A second box to type in your last name. And finally, a third box to type in your email address. Once you fill out that information, you will click Add My Name. This sends a message to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to include the Conscience Protection Act and the upcoming appropriations bill. If it passes, it would bar the federal government and any state and local governments that receive federal funding from taking action against healthcare professionals who conscientiously object to performing, paying, or participating in any procedure they find morally objectionable. The deadline for the appropriations bill is December 8th, so this is the week we need you to go to ProLifeWeekly.com. That's ProLifeWeekly.com. Type in your information and click Add My Name. We need to tell Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to include the Conscience Protection Act and the appropriations bill before next week's deadline. Turning now to more pro-life news, Texas will appeal a federal judge's decision to block the state's dismemberment abortion ban. 
U.S. District Judge Lee Yeekel says the ban imposes an undue burden on women. The dismemberment abortion ban signed into law by Governor Greg Abbott in June outlaws the abortion procedure, which involves tearing a fully formed child apart limb by limb before removing the child from the mother's womb. It's often called dilation and evacuation or a D and E abortion. Judge Yeekel's decision follows a five-day trial in early November, which included on-the-record testimony from Planned Parenthood and other abortion providers. In an interview we aired just last week, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton says that on-the-record testimony is key for pro-life efforts moving forward. We made him describe, you know, bit by bit, word by word, exactly the horrible process of, of dismembering these babies and just how brutal it is. Paxton says this is the first case of its kind to include evidence of what actually happens with a dismemberment abortion. He says he's eager to present the extensive record before the Fifth Circuit. He's the detective who led the investigation against abortionist Kermit Gosnell, and he's being recognized for his brave pro-life work. Detective James Wood received the St. John Paul II Be Not Afraid Award from the Pro-Life Union of Greater Philadelphia this November. In his acceptance speech, Detective Wood, a Catholic and one of 12 children, said his father would be so proud because St. John Paul II was his favorite. Wood said Gosnell was successfully convicted only because of God and the support of his family. Abortionist Gosnell is serving two life sentences without parole after being convicted in 2013 for the murder of three babies born alive. A 22-year-old woman reportedly becomes the first contestant with Down syndrome to compete in the Miss Minnesota USA pageant. Michaela Holmgren did not win Sunday night's pageant, but did walk away with the Spirit Award, the Director's Award, and a standing ovation. Holmgren shed tears of joy and said she was, quote, so excited. A majority of babies prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted in the womb, so Michaela is a beautiful witness for our world. Our next guest broke a long-standing tradition in the U.S. Church. He is the first non-cardinal to be elected chair of the U.S. Bishops Pro-Life Committee in nearly 40 years. Archbishop Joseph Nauman of the Archdiocese of Kansas City will take over Cardinal Timothy Dolan's pro-life role late next year. The U.S. Bishops elected Nauman as their pro-life leader during their General Assembly earlier in November. Archbishop Joseph Nauman of the Archdiocese of Kansas City joins us from Kansas City, Missouri. Your Excellency, thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure to be with you, Catherine. Thanks. Archbishop Nauman, some outlets were pitting you against Cardinal Blaise Supich in this USCCB election, calling it a bellwether vote. What did you make of that commentary and the fact that you were elected over Cardinal Supich? Well, I think... Uh, the news media is into looking for controversies and finding them where there really aren't any. Um, I, I mean, I think Cardinal Supich is an extremely talented person. The very fact that he was willing to run for the pro-life chairmanship, I think, shows his own commitment to it. And um, I think the vote, for whatever reasons, the, the bishops uh, gave me this opportunity to serve in this way. I think part of it is just the long history I've had working in the pro-life apostolate for the church. You are the first non-cardinal to be appointed as chair of the U.S. Bishops Pro-Life Committee since 1980, I believe. Why, in your opinion, do you think your brother bishops entrusted you with this role? Well, I've always liked the fact that we've elected cardinals because I think it's it's been a convention that shows the importance that the conference places on the pro-life issue. Why they made it an exception this time, I hope it's because, uh, again, my long history of working in the pro-life apostolate, I've served on the committee, I think, six terms now. So uh, most bishops have not had that opportunity to have that breadth of experience with the pro-life issue. Your Excellency, what do you see as the top priority for the U.S. bishops when it comes to the pro-life issue? Well, we take a, a multi-dimensional approach in, in trying to change the culture to a culture of life. It involves prayer, it involves education, it involves the pastoral care of those in a crisis pregnancy as well as those 
who have had an abortion and now deeply regret it, and it involves public advocacy. So I hope in some way our committee will try in each of those areas, when I do assume the chairmanship, which will be in another year, that we'll be able to in some way advance the church's work in all four of those areas. Earlier this year, you announced parishes in your Kansas City Archdiocese would stop hosting Girl Scout troops because Girl Scouts internationally support legalized abortion and hold up Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood's founder, as a role model. Has there been a lot of fallout from that decision? And why did you decide this was an important issue to take on? Well, I, this has been a, a, a long dialogue that we've been in with Girl Scouts. The Bishop's Conference under our Marriage, Family, and Youth Committee had really looked into it, uh, identified some concerns, and of course it was up to local bishops to make a decision. And in the end, uh, after this long dialogue, it was my view that we have such precious little time with our young people that we couldn't afford to entrust them to an organization that didn't share all of our values, especially on, on issues as important as the life issues on human sexuality and on, on marriage. And so it seemed to me that we needed to concentrate our resources with organizations and groups that we could partner with that shared more our viewpoints. And again, this is up to each local bishop to decide what he thinks is best. And, and I think we, we did a long, careful process. In the end, we thought this was what was best for our young people. Under your leadership in the Archdiocese of St. Louis, earlier on in your religious life, the Archdiocese began the Project Rachel Ministry. Why is this post-abortion healing ministry one that's crucial for the pro-life movement and for Catholics to support? Well, the, the gospel is all about mercy and all about forgiveness. And, and so this is an essential part of our pro-life ministry. It is reaching out to those who, usually under great pressure and duress, made a decision that they, now they deeply regret. And because our teaching has been so strong in this area, sometimes people can think they've committed an unforgivable sin. This is not an unforgivable sin. And only God's mercy and grace can really bring healing to individuals. So this is one of the most important dimensions of our pro-life ministry. You have insisted that politicians who identify as Catholics need to be held to the moral standards set by the church. Are there specific U.S. Catholic politicians in office right now you think we need to do a better job of calling out for not opposing abortion? Well, again, I think each local bishop has to make his own uh, judgment and discernment in these areas. And for instance, my decision with our former governor, Kathleen Sebelius, only happened after a long dialogue with her. And actually, it wasn't my intention to publicly uh, embarrass her, but I, I did ask her at, at one point not to present herself for communion as long as she continued to uh, uh, veto legislation that was trying to protect innocent children. And when she didn't comply with that, when she chose to go to the Eucharist, then I felt I needed to make it public. And uh, because what happens is that these politicians, when they say I'm Catholic, but I also am pro-choice, pro slash pro-abortion, and you can be a good Catholic and do this as well, they're actually usurping the role of the bishop in teaching the Catholic faith. So I think when politicians choose to kind of flaunt their Catholicity while they're contradicting it by their actions, sometimes it is necessary for a bishop to, for the safety of his people to point out uh, their actions are not consistent with our Catholic faith. Archbishop Joseph Nauman of the Archdiocese of Kansas City, thank you for your time. Thanks, Catherine, and good to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. When we come back. I was made to choose between my job and my conscience when they coerced me to assist in the termination of a 22-week-old baby. Meet the healthcare heroes speaking up for conscience rights. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. To 
joy which accompanies the birth of the Messiah is thus seen to be the foundation and fulfillment of joy at every child born into the world. As we enter into Advent this weekend, that's a quote about Christmas from St. John Paul II's encyclical, The Gospel of Life. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner. As we joyfully anticipate the birth of Christ during Advent, the abortion industry is using the season to try and bolster their business. Planned Parenthood has released a 2017 holiday gift guide, a page run by Planned Parenthood Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota Action Fund, lists gifts people can buy that would support the largest abortion provider. It includes Stand With Planned Parenthood keychains, pink lipstick, and you'll never believe this, handmade felt Christmas tree ornaments that are decorated with IUDs, a female sterilization device, and ornament details that resembles female reproductive organs. Planned Parenthood says these gifts are for people who want to spread holiday joy and support reproductive rights. Raising money for the abortion business is always abhorrible, but there may be no time more disrespectful, more irreverent, or more profane than when we celebrate the birth of Christ. Planned Parenthood, how dare you twist the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ as an infant child to promote your agenda of killing infants in the womb. It is a mockery of the Christian faith. But Christians and pro-lifers, we have an opportunity here during this Advent season to evangelize the gospel of life. Christmas centers around a baby who was born because of a woman's yes to an unplanned pregnancy. That baby in Bethlehem was our Savior Jesus Christ. As Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry continue to campaign for female sterilization, let us recognize the gift of a woman's fertility and how God himself chose to enter the earth through a mother's womb. As our world frantically shops and spends, let us ponder the mystery of the incarnation and like the shepherds and magi, be in awe and wonder of the Christ child. Let us remind our world this Christmas that God once was born a vulnerable infant to save each and every one of us and we must continue to protect vulnerable infants today. Remember, there is always something you can do to counter today's culture of death. You can pray and you can follow this week's call to action. Tell Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to include the Conscience Protection Act and the upcoming Appropriations Bill. The deadline is next week. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. We need young pro-lifers to enter the medical field today, but if the Conscience Protection Act is not soon enacted, doctors and nurses may be forced to violate their conscience or leave health care. It's happened before more than once. Now, three nurses who say they've been forced against their religious beliefs to participate in abortions are speaking out. So this discrimination will come to an end. I mean, you are the greatest country in the world. As a Filipino immigrant to the United States, Kathy DiCarlo never imagined she'd be forced to compromise her conscience in America. That the Catholic nurse emotionally recalls the day at work, she says, still gives her nightmares. I was preparing for what I thought was going to be a common procedure following a miscarriage, only to realize that I was being asked to perform an abortion on a live 22-week-old unborn baby. I immediately called the resident doctor on duty and my supervisor to find a sub. My supervisor informed me that I would have to assist with the abortion. I'm sorry. I reminded her in tears about the hospital's legal obligation to never force me to participate in an abortion, but to always find a substitute nurse. But she refused. I'll never forget that day as I watched in horror as the doctor dismembered and removed the baby's bloody limbs. And I had to account for all the pieces. Surrounded by pro-life lawmakers at a November Capitol Hill press conference, DiCarlo calls on Congress to pass the Conscience Protection Act. If passed, the bill would protect the conscience rights of healthcare professionals and others. Healthcare professionals like Faye Vinoya. They wanted all of the staff in same-day surgery to assist in the abortion. At the New Jersey hospital where Vinoya works, 
a mandatory policy went into effect announcing all nurses in the same day surgery unit were required to assist with abortions. Our jobs were threatened if we were not to follow the directives. Vinoya and her group of nurses reached out to the religious liberty law firm Alliance Defending Freedom. A settlement was reached and the hospital agreed not to force the women to participate in abortions or to replace them. But Vinoya says more still needs to be done. There are some nurses that are um, that can be forced that are there in the hospital that are not. It's not a blanket protection for everybody. In Illinois, Sandra Mendoza's nursing job was not protected. After working at the Winnebago County Health Department as a pediatric nurse for 18 years, a new mandate required all nurses be cross-trained in abortion. When Mendoza refused to participate, she lost her job. I became a nurse to save lives. I love children and I have worked with children my whole life. I, I did not come into this profession to take lives. These three nurses have become the faces of conscience violation in the United States. Their stories have stirred a renewed call for protection. With support ranging from the Twitter campaign, hashtag stand with nurses, to the most recent U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops General Assembly. Any hope, brothers, of enacting this CPA requires attach, our experts tell us, requires attaching it to must pass appropriations legislation. To a conscience protection push on Capitol Hill. We are here to ask everybody to please support the Conscience Protection Act. And this is not about abortion. This is about our right to speak up, our right to, to practice our freedom. In the hospital where I work at, we work together, Muslim, Christian, Catholic, Jewish, all of us work together in harmony for the good of the patient. And I don't, I don't think uh, it should be different anywhere else. Let's do our part to get the Conscience Protection Act passed and support these healthcare heroes. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to send your message to Congress. That's it for this edition of EWTN ProLife Weekly. You can reach us anytime with questions, ideas, comments at ProLifeWeekly at EWTN.com. I look forward to seeing you here again next week. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.